Hi, everyone. Welcome to Sunday's Other Scriptures for April 21st. This Sunday is typically called Good Shepherd Sunday, and when you take a look at our readings, you'll know why, because our gospel reading is Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd, and uh, our psalm for the day is Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, and uh, and so that's, that's pretty obvious. Uh, what may not be obvious are the other two readings, our first reading from Acts and the reading that I'm preaching on, which is from 1 John, uh, although you may be aware we're doing what's called a Lectio Continuo, that is a series of readings through the letter 1 John, and that's what I'm preaching on this month. But let's talk about these readings individually and how they tie in. Our first reading for the day is this series of readings we're doing through Acts. Even though uh, Pentecost hasn't come yet, these readings are after the day of Pentecost, they're kind of a, a preview of what happens after the Holy Spirit is released. Our first reading for the day, the Acts 4 reading, is actually a follow-up from last week's reading. In last week's reading, Peter and John are in Jerusalem, and they had healed a man who was lame, and this miracle was acclaimed by all the people, and they take advantage of this great crowd that's gathered uh, for because of this miracle to tell them about Jesus and proclaim Jesus. Well, in our reading for today, which follows on that beginning of chapter four, the uh, chief priests and the Pharisees, uh, they are upset and they have Peter and John arrested. Why? Because Peter and John have been telling people in no uncertain terms that it's in the name of Jesus that this lame man has been healed. And I'm going to be talking in the sermon about follow the leader. That's our theme for the day, about following Jesus. And there's a sense in which this follows the example of Jesus. In fact, there's it's kind of amazing that uh, right after Easter, you have Peter and John, uh, who are among the disciples, kind of hiding and uh after the day of Pentecost, they become so bold and they're not afraid at all to speak in public, even though, uh, you know, Christianity is not a legal faith. They know that they have enemies and they get thrown in jail as a result. And this is, of course, to follow the example of Christ, to be punished for doing good. I, I know, especially in our, in our culture uh, and especially lately, uh, you know, people are just very transactional. They 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 don't understand any value whatsoever in responding to evil with good. And uh, and if you're going to be punished for doing it, then why do it? And the, the answer is because as Christians, that's who we are. This is what God did. He, he did the ultimate good by receiving what we might consider the ultimate punishment, not just the physical suffering of the cross, but being separated from God, what we deserve. And so to follow Jesus, as Jesus said, is to take up our crosses and follow him. And a lot of Christians, they think that take up your cross means, um, oh, yeah, I have this illness and that's my cross to bear. Or, you know, I have to live with that person at church that I just don't get along with. And it's such a cross. No, the cross is a cross. It means to physically suffer for the sake of Jesus, not the same kind of suffering that everyone has, which is our bodies fall apart. Uh, it's not uh, people that we don't agree with or maybe things not going our way, our favorite sports team not winning or something like that. When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, he means suffer injustice and, and, and suffer severe consequences for doing the right thing. And that's what Peter and John are doing. They're following their leader. And this is uh, foolishness to the world, right? As Paul says, the cross is foolishness uh, in the eyes of the world. Uh, but this is what it means to follow Jesus uh, as our good shepherd, which leads us to Psalm 23. In Psalm 23, of course, you have David famously uh, a shepherd boy out in the fields when he's called in. Uh, and the uh, the prophet uh, has uh, has looked at these brothers that David has and says, no, God says not them. And then the, the run to the litter, the youngest one, David, comes in and he says, oh, God says this is the one who's going to be the next king of Israel. Uh, David was, however, ferocious at heart. He had actually fought off wild animals. And so uh, it's uh, you know, no surprise that he would write a song about how the Lord is his shepherd. And uh, this is such a famous psalm but a couple of things that i that i hope you'll think about um uh, you know the first couple passages it says um you know the lord is my shepherd i shall not be in want or then that is there's nothing that i'm gonna need uh, you know for us in our culture it doesn't mean we're not going to want things it means that there are there's nothing that we need that we're not going to have uh and that 
He it makes us lie down in green pastures, lets us walk beside still water. I, I understand that sheep actually are skittish around um, heavy, fast flowing water, cascading water, uh, turbulent water. So still water means that they can drink and green pastures means that they're gonna rest there and they're gonna eat and they're gonna, they're gonna grow fat and healthy. Um, and uh, then there's this thing, he restores my soul. He uh, makes me to walk in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Um, what are paths of righteousness for us? What way is it that other people don't take that we're called to take because we follow Jesus? And, and how does that bring glory to his name? Uh, we're called Christians, so we ought to do the righteous thing, not the thing that's the unrighteous, but the normal thing or the popular thing. Uh, and then it talks about uh, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is the same rod in that passage that's famously misapplied, spare the rod and spoil the child. The rod was never used by the good shepherd to beat the sheep, never. It doesn't mean that you beat your child. That's not what it means. Uh, a rod was used to set boundaries and it was used actually to fight off predators. That's what it was for. And so, um, you know, that kind of blends new light on spare the rod and spoil the child. And then also um, the staff, the staff was uh, used also to fight off predators and the crook that we often see in pictures. I don't know if Palestinian shepherds actually used a shepherd's crook the way European shepherds did, but um, the, the staff was used to rescue sheep. It was a long pole that could use to reach them if they were, you know, they were generally in hilly, rocky country. And, uh, and it was often a, a vehicle of rescue. So, um, and then we have this valley of the shadow of death, which is not death itself. Uh, literally, it's the valley of, of death shade meaning super dark shade and sheep being naturally skittish creatures, of course, are going to be afraid and startled by anything that they can't see that pops out of the shadows. And, um, and so, you know, when we're scared to death, which is what that means, you know, how is it that God's rod and staff that they comfort us, bring us comfort? And then there's this passage, it kind of shifts to a royal banqueting hall where God prepares a table before us in the presence of their enemies, which means um, fellowship with people who hate us. And this too was the example of Jesus, wasn't it? Um, that, you know, God vindicated him because that's what this is a picture of is vindication. And, uh, you know, then, you, you know, the rest, uh, the the oil that God anoints us with, which was, you know, something that, that sheep would be wonderful, keep them from, you know, itching, your cup overflowing, um, just that God would bless us now and in eternity. And then we go to the gospel reading where Jesus in John 10 says, I am the good shepherd. Well, what makes him good? Well, for one thing, unlike the hired hand, he's willing to lay down his life for the sheep. That is to, to die rather than let the sheep be torn apart by some predator. And uh, another thing is that as a good shepherd, he knows his sheep and they know him. And in other places, they says, you know, my sheep listen to my voice. They'll only listen to my voice. They won't listen to a deceiver which is especially helpful in this day and age, because I, I hear Christians all the time, uh, quoted and so on, who are not actually listening to the Good Shepherd. They're listening to other voices. They're following other people. They are often um, political evangelicals and not biblical evangelicals, we would say. Uh, and and you know the Good Shepherd knows his sheep. He's not like um, some false guru or uh, you know false religion leader who um, you know cares not for the sheep. He knows us. He cares for us. He can be trusted. And uh, and then at the end of this passage, Jesus says, "I have authority to lay down my life, which he's going to do on the cross, and to take it up again." which he's going to do, which is very intriguing. So, you know, Jesus is at the beginning of this passage, it seems like he's saying, I am the Lord because the Lord is my shepherd, right? And he says, I am the good shepherd. It's a claim to be God. And at the end, it's a claim not only to be God, but to be one who would sacrifice his life and then be resurrected. So in our uh, reading from 1 John, then, the passage that I'm going to preach on, uh, John talks about this as being the ultimate in love, the, the way that we define love. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. You know, you hear people say, oh, I love you, you know, if they're some kind of popular celebrity. Oh, I love you all. Well, they love being loved is what they love. They don't know the people in the crowd. Uh, they they just love the adulation of the crowd. but uh, when we talk about God loving us in the person of Jesus, it's that not only does he know us, but he's willing to sacrifice himself for us. 
And for us to have that kind of love, to follow Jesus, is to be willing to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And uh, so, you know, John talks about this. If we have material possessions and we see our brother in need but have no pity on him, how can the love of God be in us? Uh, you know, and he, he goes on to urge us to love not just with words, not just, oh, I'll pray for you, but to love with actions. Uh, as we say in our culture, actions speak louder than words. And sometimes our lack of action drowns out all our pious words. Um, and, you know, this is how we know we belong to the truth is, is if we actually do what we say we're going to do, authentic action, because this was God didn't just make false promises. He actually sent his son to enact those promises. So if our hearts condemn us and we feel guilty, we take refuge in that, that God uh, has rescued us and sets us at ease and that God is greater than our hearts. Uh, you know, a lot of children's movies I've seen, uh, you know, and a lot of adult movies for that matter say that you should follow your heart. But the problem is God is greater than your heart. God knows better than your heart. You should follow God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say follow your heart. The Bible says follow God and he will lead you in the right path. So that's the direction that I want to go down is the, the direction of following God in love, not just warm feelings, not just pious words, but love that actually plays out in action and uh, and the power of the Holy Spirit to empower us to do that and to assure us that we belong to the Good Shepherd. I hope you have a great discussion this week. The Lord be with you.